Well, good morning everyone. My name is Fabian Cárdenas. I'm coming from the University of Bogotá. Um, I'm glad to be here. Thank you, panels, for letting me, letting me <coughs> jump in in the middle of this very interesting panel in the very last minute. So I'm very grateful for all of you. So the title of my presentation uh, is Interpreting Customer International Law as an Argumentative Concept. And I should start by, uh, okay, thank you, making some caveats uh, regarding this presentation. I, I don't intend to deliver like a fully elaborated idea about interpreting customer international law, but I just want to, to provoke you with some reflections which I consider are relevant for the discussion of the interpretation of customer international law. So I want to start with, with this, this, with this, um, okay, yeah. With this extract, with a little premise, of which you are fully aware, probably you were, reading this as kids. I showed my masterpiece to the grown ups. Yeah, here we are. <laughs> and asked them whether the drawing frightened them. But they answered, frightened. Why should one why should anyone be frightened by hats? My drawing was not a picture of a hat. It was a picture of a boa constructor digesting an elephant. But since the grown-ups were not able to understand it, I made another drawing. I drew the inside of a boa constrictor so that the grown-ups could see it clearly. So I think this, this is a matter of interpretation. And this is kind of the same uh, epistemological question which got us here at this very moment. Uh, so be before going into, into my point, I think that also uh, some, some, some caveats are, are needed regarding the positions on, on hermeneutics in customer international law. And first of all, I, we should accept, or at least take a stand regarding whether it is possible to give meaning to a norm of customer international law. I mean, we, we, we wouldn't have this very panel if we wouldn't accept that, because we are fully aware that there are trends in international legal scholarship which consider that interpretation is not needed because in law, uh, a purely uh, process of doing this legal syllogism, how do you pronounce that, syllogism, is, is, is required. You don't need interpretation, you just apply the law and that's it. But regarding that and, and, and taking this stand, you have two possibilities. Either you, you accept that the interpreter is capable of finding the meaning, and this is one of the main uh, stands of academic and legal scholarship, uh, including the very ICJ, this, in this group of people. But also, you can take a stance in which you emphasize the role of the interpreter. And does the interpreter, interpreter then construct the meaning? And that's another possibility. Uh, so, regarding this, I think that even though I am aware that the panels on the theory and the concept of customer international law were yesterday, I just wanted to, to stress that the concept and the, the identification of customer international law is needed as regards the process of uh, interpretation. Because I believe, and I agree with those who believe that, that interpretation is closely intertwined with, with processes of law ascertainment and content determination. Of course, you can also consider that content determination and interpretation is the very same thing. But once you believe that uh, the identification criteria of customer international law is not, not finished yet, despite of the recent work of the International Law Commission on the identification of customer international law, uh, you, you have to accept that those processes are intertwined. So what I believe is that when you are called upon to determine the content of a customary rule, you could be also creating the jarstic uh, criteria for law ascertainment and you could be also interpreting and continue with the development of the norm. Uh, I believe that those processes are more like uh, artificial uh, conceptual philosophical uh, arguments which we the scholars try to do in order to understand this mess, you know, of this uh, malleable source like customer international law. And why is it the mess in the very first place? Because it's not written, so it's just like this 
little prince hat is just there and of course you see the hat and and we can think whatever we want and we, we sit here and discuss what we believe about this hat but at the end of course it's not there so even though I'm, I'm sure that John probably emphasized this yesterday but we should be aware of which are the purposes of those three different intellectual processes so in law ascertainment you, you establish how to find the norm. And I had the opportunity to write a paper uh, which I titled The Recipe of Customary International Law. So I believe that when you come to the question of, of law ascertainment, you essentially have a recipe, like if you were cooking some lunch or dinner. So you have the recipe, you open your recipe, and you make it. So that's at least the aim of the law ascertainment criteria. When you are into the process of content determination, you use the recipe and you prepare your, your dinner, you know, you find the norm and you say, okay, here it is. And I, you can either say that, that the process is finished there or you can say that interpretation is a, uh, the third intellectual process. When you give meaning to the, to the norm, so you establish the criteria to find the norm and then you give meaning to the norm in a concrete case. And of course, I am aware that interpretation could be related to content determination and it's like, like the same thing, but in cases such as, I don't know, let's, let's call some examples, the, the, the prohibition of genocide or the crime of aggression, let's say, you find the norm, but at some point you don't know what the norm means. So you are aware that, that genocide is prohibited, you are aware that uh, the crime of aggression exists, but you don't know what it means. So, so you, you, you determine its content, but then you keep developing it through the ways of interpretation. So I believe those processes are intertwined all the time. And, and when a court, an international tribunal, or any law applying authority is called upon to determine the content of customer international law, the very core is also developing law ascertaining criteria and is interpreting this content termination thing. I, I don't mean to go into cases right now, but, but I think that the, the different references made by, by my colleagues here in this panel are explanatory enough of, the, of, of this method. The very ICJ, they have, they have some criteria, but you are aware they don't apply it. They say they have it, but they, they don't usually apply it. Uh, in my case, I have been studying international environmental law, and at least from this side, I could assert you that the court has never gone into the application of the, of the so-called uh, criteria for establishing customer international law is always established by assertion, the court says it exists or it doesn't, and that's it, period. So you have the criteria, but you don't have it. You formally have it, but materially, practically, you never apply it, so I think, so what's the deal? Why, why we have to go into this if at the end you are not using it? You buy the hat, but you don't use it, so what else? Uh, in, in, in this in this trend, I wanted to call Duncan Hollis from the Australian Handbook on the sources of, of international law, which has uh, pointed out the relation between those three different or two different processes. International lawyers do not simply interpret from the sources of international law, they also source international law from acts of interpretation. So you, when you interpret, you source. When you source, you interpret. So at the end, the processes are intertwined. Of course, I'm not against like the, the the need to do research and interpretation. We need it, of course, I agree with that, but my only point is just to provoke you about different difficulties that we have uh, with this regard. So, why, why do we need to go into law ascertainment when, when we want to face the, you know, the, the maps of uh, customer international law interpretation? I think that the answer is because we have this lack of a unified law ascertainment criteria. So you also have to take a stand on this regard. Either you accept as a dogma the two element approach, which is of course probably the easiest way, just not to get knots with this with this issue. So you accept it as a dogma. You just like many uh, textbooks do. They just say okay, the ICJ says that 
customer international law is produced by both opinion juries and state practice. Okay, I don't want to go into this. Let's accept this as a, as a dogma and start from scratch with the issue of interpretation. So if you accept the dogma and you take a formalist stance, you, you could say that those processes are separable. Yeah, and then you can go into customer international law interpretation. But if you, as I do, believe that there is a lack of a unified law ascertainment criteria and you take an anti-formalistic uh, stance, you, you have to accept that those processes are inseparable and when you go into customer international law interpretation, you have to always go into law ascertainment and content determination at the very same time because they are, they are intertwined. Uh, in any case, I, I believe that when it regards with uh, with regards uh, to, to the lack of law ascertaining criteria, uh, I, you have to take a stance. And at least my stance is that this, this two element approach is just one out of many possible approaches. It's just one out of many. And of course, I am aware of, about the, the hard work of the International Law Commission on this regard and the conclusions, and I've read them. And to my view, they, they are just the reincarnation of a uh, centennial, you know, uh, theoretical development, but at the end it's just one out of many, po uh, many possible approaches. And of course, uh, I'm not the first person arguing that customer, that customer international law is uh, an argumentative development. I have been using uh, the, some theoretical uh, thesis on this regard. And I, I should, for instance, quote this very famous uh, paragraph from Koskinieni in the Max Planck Encyclopedia on, on Public International Law, in which he stated, international law is an argumentative practice. It is about persuading target audiences, such as courts, colleagues, politicians, readers of legal texts, about the lawfulness, uh, legitimacy, justice, and possibility, validity of international law. Uh, from this regard, I, I should be also stress that there are also trends which uh, see interpretation uh, from the perspective of the interpreter. There is Twerkin, Fish, Harnas, Koskinyemi, who believe that uh, interpretation concerns the interpreter. The interpreter has the, the final saying regarding interpretation and despite of the existence of rules of interpretation. So at the end, interpretation concerns arguments and perspectives among a community of pro professionals. So, so I, I, I believe that from, from this regard, and taking into account that there is not a final saying on, on the law ascertaining criteria of customer international law, there is neither uh, criteria on, on interpretation in customer international law. So what do you see there? Oh. What do you want to see or what do you want to be seen? So at the end we are both consumers and producers of this rule of in interpretation. So the little prince said, after drawing the hat, he said, okay, my drawing wasn't a picture of a hat. It was a picture of a boa constrictor digesting an elephant, but since the grown-ups were not able to understand it, I made another drawing. I drew the inside of a boa constrictor so that the grown-ups, you know, they could see it clearly. So I think that's, that's essentially what we do when, when it concerns to interpretation. We, we just draw a customer international law and if the grown-ups, they, they don't get it, then we have to, to, to draw the, the inside of it. And, and how do we draw it? We draw it through the means of argumentation, legal argumentation. And I don't, I don't need more proofs that, that this very panel and this very event, we, we, we're here like gathering together in order to, to draw the things inside of the BOA constructor, you know? At the end, courts like the ICJ or, or the ICC, uh, I mean, they wouldn't even follow, you know, any of those criteria. They would just assert it and, and that's it. But, we essentially build and construct true, of course, the processes of legal argumentation. I am not suggesting that this is like a 
like an argumentative mess, you have to follow the, the rules of argumentation, but at the end it's, it's essentially built and construed and we have to accept it as such and develop it as such. So thank you so much.